Hello, my name is William Gladstone. I'm the publisher of Waterside Productions, and I'm delighted to present today Law and Addiction with my good friend, trial attorney, and author Mike Papantonio. Good to be here, Bill. Mike, right off the bat, Law and Addiction. Why did you write this novel? Well, first of all, I was asked to get involved in, in a, a case in the United States. It's, it's, it's a, a case that handles really all of the opioid cases around the country. It's, a, it's filed in Cleveland, Ohio, and it's an MDL case. And I was asked by a lawyer... MDL, what is yeah, an MDL? Yeah, it's a multi-district litigation. That's where the federal government says we want... that we have such a big problem uh, throughout the country that we have to bring it all under one roof and we have to handle the case under that one roof. And that's in Cleveland, Ohio. But, but to back up, before I got started there uh, with, with that part of, the, of this case, I was contacted by a young lawyer uh, who, as a matter of fact, is a, a character in the book that said, I have this case. We kind of need to work together on it. Let's get started. And as I started looking at the project, at the catastrophe that had been caused throughout the country with opioids, um, it, it interested me to get started. I know when we first talked about this novel, I actually suggested, Mike, you've got all the dope, you've got all the inside information, why won't you write this just as a nonfiction book? Yeah, well, I do have all the information. There, most of it I can't talk about at this point because there's a pending case going on. But the interesting thing about this, the, uh, I've, I've written two books before this that also involve cases that probably are the biggest cases in the country. It's interesting. People want to be entertained while they learn. That's what I, I think I've, I've decided here. You know, it's one, thing to take a, it's one thing to take a fiction book to the beach and you're going to spend a couple of days reading it. But in a perfect world, you spend time reading that book and then you walk away and realize you learned something. These books, Law and Addiction, for example, most of it is based completely on what is, what's actually happening throughout the country. Names have been changed. Uh, you know, we don't, uh, we're not talking about particular distributors or t uh, particular manufacturers, but it tells the story of how we got where we are now. How do we have this catastrophe to where 150 people will die today and tomorrow and the next day from opioid addiction? So the reason this book, I think, is, is so intriguing is it does tell the story, but it tells the story through lawyers that are actually working on the, book, on, the, on, the, on the case, and it tells the story through the eyes of the victims. Um, you know, what happens a lot of times, Bill, is um, I think thriller writers are so set on having to put um, every third chapter, there has to be a murder, there has to be some blood and gore in the third, in third or fourth chapter, and uh, that, that kind of became a norm within, within thrillers. And then Grisham came along and he said, you know, we can, tell, we can tell a really good story. We can give a thriller story without all of that. Let's tell a story we, where we tell it from the victim's perspective. What is it that they're going through because of this event? And um, so that's the way this is, this is written. There's a lot of intrigue. It's a, definitely a thriller. Well, one of the things that I liked very much was the characters. The characters really grab you because they're not, at least for me, what I would have anticipated as the drug victims. They're, you, you have a homecoming queen, you have uh, family members who are stalwart members of the community, and they all succumb to this opioid addiction. Yeah, that's a reality. Most people, um, when they think of the opioid addiction, they think, it, oh, gee, that's somebody else. That'll never happen to our family. If you were to line up 10 people arbitrarily and you say, have you been affected by the opioid crisis? They will, most of them will say, yes, I have. I've had family members affected. I've had family members that have overdosed. I've had a family members that are in rehab. It's touched everybody. And I think that's what law and addiction does is it, it, it actually humanizes the story. For example, you talk about the homecoming queen, Anna is a mm -hmm. character in the book. She's very real. You see, th I've met so many Annas that, that have started off not having any suspicion that the pill that they're taking because they've sprained their ankle or they've hurt their back is going to make them into opioid addicts. And that's the ugly thing about opioids. The industry came in, and this book does talks about this, how it is that they told the American public that if you take this pill, there's something special about the pill. You don't have to worry about this opioid. The truth is it's a narcotic. 
It's like any other narcotic. There's nothing special about it. In fact, it's more addictive than other, some of the other well, narcotics. Well, that brings me to narcotics. one of the other aspects of the novel that I really enjoyed, the bad guys. I really like some of the bad guys. And uh, talk a little bit about, because there's different levels of evil in they're, this novel. I mean, all the way from the corporate honchos down to kind of the street yeah. guys. Yeah, the, the, in this book, it's no, there's no one company that I'm mm -hmm. talking about here. It's a composite, I think, generally my take from a fiction standpoint of how do you explain what happened. And to, to believe that just we woke up one day and 150 people were dying from addictive overdoses from opioids and not understand how that happened. If we think it just happened uh, just serendipitously, it, it, it happened because people planned it. And as, as, as I started here, a lot of times people want to blame the, the, the addict. They want to say, well, this, this 19 year old child that was a valedictorian and you know, the next day she's an opioid addict. Somehow she's weak-minded. Somehow it's her fault. If you read this book, you understand that as I talk about how it happens, that is reality. It happens in little grades. It's almost like uh, nowadays I think most doctors understand you don't give more than seven pills to anybody. But the industry had convinced doctors in the early days that it was okay to give them 90 pills and that they weren't going to become addicted in, to, to the product. And, and the industry knew better. The industry had all the information they needed to say, well, we really shouldn't be telling people that because it really doesn't, it doesn't explain exactly how bad the product is. So parents wouldn't think of anything of taking their child to the dentist and they get a, they get a molar pulled and they said, Jane, start taking this product. That's Anna. That's Anna mm -hmm. in this book you see. And she moves towards the addiction problem the same way thousands and tens of thousands. Well, I, I know when we first talked about this novel, you actually wanted to call it Zombieland because yeah. you've spent a lot of time in these communities that have been devastated. Right. Um, explain yeah, a little bit zombie, why, zombie, what Zombieland means yeah, to zombie you. Zombieland is a real term that they use in places like the southern parts of um, uh, the southern parts of Ohio in the Ohio River Valley and uh, in West Virginia. Zombie land, the way that developed was this. You would have a city that was totally, you know, it was, it was progressive in all kinds of ways. They were, you know, businesses there. They were productive. There was a tax base. Mom and pop had businesses all up and down the, the road. And then all of a sudden, the opioid industry changed that. If you go to a city, I could name, there's dozens all over the country, Bill. But it, let, let's use Kermit, West Virginia. I like to use that because it really tells the story. Kermit, West Virginia was a city in West, in West Virginia where there's a population of 400 people, okay? The industry sold six million, pe uh, million pills into that six city million e every year, every, every year. I, I can't do the math in my head, yeah. but that's a lot of pills yeah. per person. <laughs> the community they knew could not absorb that. So what, the, what was created was a glut and that glut of pills had to go somewhere, right? So the industry, uh, you know, there was plenty of reasons for the industry to understand where it was going. It was being diverted towards criminal activity. It was being built, it was being diverted towards pill mills that were illegal pill mills. And the company was doing business right there in around Kermit. Well, they one, saw it one, of the, one of the most intriguing chapters is a description in Law and Addiction of the pill mill yeah. and how the sales rep actually used to drive right by the pill mill and see these Yeah, people. well, that's, that's talked about in the, the characters that I've created mm -hmm. in this book. Uh, they're composites, you know. They're, they're, uh, there's no one company, for example, that I talk about in this book. It's a composite of what all of them, in some form or fashion, some level, uh, knew or could have known about what was happening. But the best way I can describe that is every pharmaceutical company has what they call detailers. The t detailer goes to, to the town. Their job is to call on doctors. Their job is to sell more product in that city. And so the detailer lives right there in the city, right? Three miles down the road is the pill mill from where he or she lives. They see at 8 o'clock in the morning people lined up around the pill mill, standing there in their pajamas waiting to get, to get their narcotic fix. So law and addiction, it, it, it takes stories like that. And it, but, it, but the difference is, Bill, is it puts a person with it. We like to look at this, at this whole, we like to look at this whole catastrophe and not put a face with it. This book does that because the people in this book are a composite of so many people that I've 
talked to firsthand and met firsthand. Well, some of the evil characters are composites, too. Yeah. And one of the things that comes through this novel is it's not just the drug companies who are at fault here, that you also have a lot of politicians in what I think you've referred to in other interviews as the revolving door between the drug companies and some of the organizations that are supposed to be protecting the American public. Yeah, I think the, the thing, w when you read Law and Addiction, as I say, you'll be entertained. That's the whole purpose of a thriller. You know, I don't want to read it just, mm -hmm. I'm not in the mood just for education today. I want to be entertained as I'm reading. And as you're reading this book, you start seeing this thread that flows through the book, and that is where regulatory industry, the, the people that were supposed to be mm -hmm. looking out, the FDA, you see, or whatever it may have been, the DEA, we believed that they were looking out for us. But all that was happening, Bill, is you had, um, th and this book explains it through some real characters, that day one that, that person may be working for the FDA and they're making X number of dollars, and then day two they're working for the industry and they're making five times X number of dollars. And so the question then becomes, are regulators really looking out for us? You know, and that, that's, there's some discussion of that, about that, but it's not a preachy discussion. There's nothing preachy in this book. The book is just simply there to say, okay, I read it, I get the characters, but as you're reading it, you're picking up this information. You're understanding that the U.S. government, I mean, every, the two presidents, under two presidents, that they allowed this to, to go on because they, they, they didn't get the Department of Justice to do what they should have done. Now we see the Department of Justice is paying attention to it. There's trials going on uh, right in Massachusetts, for example, where one of the companies is being tried for the conduct, racketeering kind of conduct, fraud kind of conduct, where they lied to users, they lied to regulators, they lied to the American public. And so now you have some courageous uh, prosecutors that are saying, let's take that to trial. Let's see how that tries. And so that's talked about in this book. Who are the people that were, you know, you can't blame it only on them because none of this happened without a design by the industry, you see. You had to have that design. But then you have to say, why wasn't it stopped? Why didn't this attorney general or that attorney general or this prosecutor do what they should have done 10 years ago? So all of it, all of it is based on on real life, uh, there's nothing in here where you read and you go, uh, I can promise you, there's nothing you'll read in here. And if, if your mind goes, that can't be true, trust me, it is. Well, <laughs> it you is. certainly learn a lot about our legal system and the way these cases are really handled, that it's not one attorney. And that I know in your specialty, you're representing 700 attorneys? Well, or I 700 represent 700 communities, uh, communities throughout the country. The re here's, here's what I represent. A typical community had to pay for the destruction that was caused by opioids, okay? The industry understood that they were creating narcotic addicts in a particular city. That city had to pay for the police, the increased cost for police, the increased cost for hospitalization, the increased cost for rehab, the increased cost for child dependency courts. Think about this. The addiction is, is so bad in some of these cities that there are record numbers of children that are being taken away from their parents because both parents are drug addicts. When I say drug addicts, I'm talking about opioid addicts. I'm talking about came through the system that day one it looked like Ozzy and Harriet. It looked like the all-American family. In day two, the, they're losing their children in court because they can't take care of them. So the city has to, city has to foot that bill. They have to build an infrastructure for that. Taxpayers have to end up footing that bill. And so the cities I represent saying, that's not right. Why wouldn't the people who are responsible for Why won't the corporations who put these toxins into our community be responsible so for paying? So I assume then one of your ultimate goals for law and addiction as a novel is just to get the American people aware of what has happened and to start the process of having greater empathy for the victims of this epidemic. Well, it's a remarkable thing. Um, I don't think, I mean, I've, I've been, as you may or may not know, I've been working in, um, in media for a lot of years. I was a contributor for, uh, with Ed Schultz, for mm -hmm. example, on MSNBC. I worked with uh, uh, people all the way back to the <coughs> America days with Rachel Maddow and people that are in this business. And, you know, you think that they can tell these kinds of stories. 
but they can't. The reason they can't is because advertisers don't let them. If you have a, if you have a company that's spending $10 million a year advertising their drug, the guy sitting on the 50th floor that's calculating what are our advertising dollars looking like, they're not going to let you tell the story. And so that's what happened with this for a very long time. Corporate media ignored this story. They had it right in front of them and they ignored it. And then suddenly everything reaches critical mass and the problem becomes so catastrophic that all, all of a sudden you have 60 minutes paying attention or you've got, um, you know, the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post. Probably some of the best writing that's ever been done on this it comes from the Washington Post. Those are the, the superb writers that once they got the story and once they understood this is such a catastrophe that it might be irreversible for a decade, they got involved and they're telling the story right now. So this book tells the same stories, but it, it's not news. I mean, it doesn't, it's not presented to you in a news flash. It's a story well, about decent people whose lives are turned upside down by the conduct of corporate America that we're producing these, these opioids. So I know you're very, very busy with your legal work. So tell me a little bit about the process you use when you sit down and say, I'm going to write a novel. How do you, well, how do you, <clears throat> you know, okay. So first of all, with these types of novels, the two before them, as I say, were based on actual cases. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for me to take the documents, take the pleadings, take what happened in court, sit it in front of me and say, I really like this part of the story. I like this part of the story. I like this part of the story. And then take those and roll them into a story that is, uh, it's an entertainment story. It's not just, let me tell you what I did. You know, I'm so appalled by all of these, I, I call them, they're, they're just narcissistic books that come out by, you know, maybe it's a politician or a lawyer that thinks they're bigger than life. You know, mm -hmm. I wanna, let me tell you about me. People don't wanna read about those kinds of books. Sometimes, uh, you know, you'll have, occasionally, you'll have one that's, that's the exception to the rule. But what they wanna read is they wanna read maybe what's your experience. In this, these books, like Law and Addiction, th those are my experiences in court, in trial, in discovery, in preparing for a case, but they're just rolled into a fiction book that entertains while it educates. Well, just to get a little more specific, so when you started with Law and Addiction, did you sit down and outline the entire book? Yeah, yeah, every, I think to jump into a book and not have the ending of the story, <laughs> <laughs> uh, some, some authors do that, I, I, you know, more power to them. I don't have that level of talent to where I can simply start writing. Everything is planned out uh, literally to, to the chapter by chapter. And do you yeah. have a specific room in your house where you write? A specific yes, time I do. of day? I do. I have, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I'm a night crawler where I stay up in the wee hours of the morning writing because sometimes it's the only time I have. And I don't know, there's that, there's that quiet and it gives you, you'll finish a day. Okay, and you've done something that appeared in court that, that some court element, some deposition element, some pleading element, some document that you saw, and you'll say, I want to write about this today. And so you go and then you create that, you take that element and you roll it into the fiction story. Obviously, I can't talk about documents that are coming out in trial. There's, there's limitations on what I can talk about while something's pending. But after it's over, <laughs> or after it's over, it's Katie bar the door. Well, one of the things I enjoy as your publisher is you have an unlimited caseload of great yeah. novel material. Yeah. So I know we're going to be getting a future novel on terrorism and yeah. we have some others in the works. But I do think that of all the novels you've written, uh, Law and Addiction is the most important to date. Be I think it is important. I think uh, the first one was called Law and Disorder and it had to do with uh, huge environmental cases huge pharmaceutical case that was a product that was killing women. Um, it was a birth control pill that I actually handled. It, it, uh, the second one dealt with the arms industry. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're cases that I actually handle. And you know, the first rule to writing uh, the, is write what you know. Mm -hmm. And when you see something occurring in a courtroom, you'll say, I, I, I like that character. Let me, let me do something with that character. I like this judge. Let me do something with that judge. And you decide, how am I going to handle him? Is it going to be favorable or unfavorable? And you, you, know, you have your way of taking that material that's occurring every day around you and going home that night and maybe staying up till 3 o'clock in the morning and saying, i got to get this down. And one thing I learned, when you write late at night, 
is to stop <laughs> when you're writing with a heavy, with, with a great hand. In other words, if you're writing a chapter and you go, wow, I really love that chapter, stop, <laughs> go to bed, get up. And that way, when you start writing the next day, you can pick up with something that you already have in your head. Mm -hmm. It's positive, it's moving, and you never get that that writer's dry spell that occurs sometimes. What, what so far in your writing career has given you the most joy from the writing? I think Law and Addiction. Law and Addiction because it's, I, I think Law and Addiction because it's so, it's, it's, a, it's affecting everybody and they don't really understand. They just don't understand. They want to blame it on somebody else. I, it's a, it's a, I, I call it the ostrich syndrome that this can't happen to me. And then all of a sudden, your child is injured. Uh, they sprain their ankle or they have a tooth pulled and somebody gives them, uh, you know, 90 opioids. And all of a sudden, little Johnny is not little Johnny anymore. Little Johnny's out on the street trying to find drugs any way he can. And so, so all of a sudden, the, the, the thing that appealed to me about this is because when people read it, they can say, oh, I know that. That happened to my friend. Maybe that happened to my family. And they can get over that idea of trying to blame everybody else, trying to blame that, that child who might have been the quarterback of his football team, might have been valedictorian, was on his way to university, and all of like the character here. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, that, the character here, uh, where Jake said, you know, you killed my brother. Well, this was one of the, the real eye-opening uh, moments for me as your publisher and reader of the book is these are not bad guys. These are good people. <laughs> and neighbors. it really did change my, my whole thought about the opioid crisis. I think I'm pretty much like most people. Eh, you know. It I, happens to somebody else, yeah, right? And it, that, it's I, not, I, don't, I don't have an addictive personality. Mm -hmm. I've never had an alcohol problem. Uh, I, I can stop this. What they don't understand, Bill, and, and this talks about it very clearly. I, you know, there's characters mm -hmm. in here that explain it by way of their narrative. That's uh, one thing I like about this is I like, I like the narratives. I like mm -hmm. the dialogue because it's, it's real. Mm -hmm. And they explain the idea that a person doesn't have control over the chemistry that's surging through their bloodstream. Okay? Yeah, one of the most powerful s chapters is when... I don't want to give away the, the ending, but when one of the main characters is addicted, for, yeah. forcibly yeah. addicted. Forcibly addicted, And, and yeah. what he has to go through. Yeah. Very powerful. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Jake. You will love yeah. Jake. Uh, Jake, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I work with a lot of young lawyers. And there's, a, there's three of them that I tried to roll into Jake because they're just tenacious. These are kids that graduated the top of their class in law school. They got out of law school and they said, I want to do something that matters. In this situation, I don't want to tell too much, but Jake has a real reason that he has to undertake this, this, this job of going, against, going up against the biggest, most powerful, most connected, most moneyed industry in the world, literally in the world. And, um, and he does it. You know, it's, it's, it's a good story. Um, we're, we only have a minute left. I'm going to just close with one of the things that's also very interesting about the novel is it talks about the community and how the communities disintegrate and... Zombie lands. Yeah. That's this notion of zombie land. As you said, I started to title it zombie land because it's real. Yeah. So what happens is it's not just the individuals who suffer, but it's really all of us yeah. that are suffering. So I want to just thank you for listening. And go out and get a copy of Law and Addiction. You're going to enjoy the read. And seriously, recommend it to everyone you know. They will thank you.